All right, welcome to the show. Man, let's let's do this thing. Man, it's great to have you here as always. Uh, it must be Sunday again. It sure feels like a Sunday to me anyway. And it's been a, it's been a long couple weeks, right? It's been a long few months. Long interesting period of life uh in a very short period of time. It's so much to say, so much to talk about. We won't cover even just the tiniest little bit of it, uh, but we'll do our best. <laughs> that's, that's all I could ever do. Listen, if you want to follow along, as always, go to TowardAnarchy.com. And from there, you can contact the show. You can hang out in the chat room. Uh, you can listen to the show from there. You can listen to the archives. Most importantly, I think you can you can get to us on the social media. You can sign up for the email list. All the things that make it uh, possible for you to follow along, you know, like, share, subscribe, do all those things that make it possible uh, to keep this thing growing like it seems to do every month. I, I, it amazes me every month at the beginning of a new month when I start over because, you know, I've, I've watched the, the previous month's numbers change and, and I, can't, I can't help but look at them just simply having to log in to update the website and make changes and to do the the page for each weekend. Uh, and, and so I can't help but see some of the numbers and the one number that I see consistently because it's just, it's, it's right there when I log in is the amount of data that the website puts out every month. And it just keeps growing month after month after month first it was a gig and then it was two gigs and now it's 15 gigs and 20 gigs and and i i watched it today when i logged in and it's already set to to serve up 30 gigs of data by the end of the month at this point already and we're only seven days into the month and that's just amazing because that's just on the uh you know it's just on drawing people to the show while it's live right now and then, of course, people come in to see that archive. And I told you about that amazing long period number, the long period of time number that is spent on the website of people that, that stay and actually hang out on the website and listen to the show. It's just an unbelievable number. And that's all that's all because of you. And it's all because of the likes and the shares and the follows and the subscribes, whether it's on the, the YouTube, which I need to update, uh, tune in which was I finally, after months, I finally, literally six months, finally got that figured out and got them to update everything. Most of this stuff is pretty straightforward, but this this was not. And it took forever for me to get them to do it because you actually have to like email them and tell them to change the information. It's kind of weird. Most of the other stuff, it just grabs you, you once. You just tell them, here's where the information can be found, and I change it each week on the website as I put a new archive in there, and and they just pull the information out of the But That's the whole point of it. That was the reason it was created That's it, it, for doing specifically just exactly this and so that people could get it uh, delivered to them without having to think about it. They could literally just grab a website address, a page, and always have the latest show. One of the the best ways that I know that uh, my archive has gone up and that everything is working perfect because uh, it's always great. I always know because I get the archive from the archive from the, the, the Republic Broadcasting Network page. So that's pretty cool. I always know that it's there. There's always something. So I can <laughs> in an emergency, I can always just point to it if I wanted to. But I keep my own, and that's what feeds the – the RSS feed, that's what feeds all the streams for the TuneIn and the iHeartRadio and all that stuff. And and I couldn't believe that it would take so long for it to get updated. Uh, but at least, you know, I had it updated on my end. So anybody that would get it raw would get it. And that's what I, what I was saying about one of the best ways to get this stuff is to get that raw RSS feed and just plug it into your email client and then it's delivered to you just like email would be. I have every every episode of the show uh, from the beginning of the year this year. It's just right here on my e in my email and I can just click right there on Toward Anarchy and pull up any episode I want to at any point. It's it's just one of the easiest ways to do it. I happen to use Outlook because I have the Office, Office 
365, I buy that every year. And then I have, you know, cause it's multiple copies and I have multiple computers and I have children who are students that need office and to be able, you know, I, they, I have reasons for having a, a larger package like that. Ha ha ha. Uh, where, whereas some people might just have the smaller package. I uh, have the great big um, office package. So that I have tools like uh, access to build databases and things like that with you know, just some geek stuff. I, I have a little extra time today uh, in the first hour of the show. We're doing things a little bit differently. If you're following along, you may already know what's happening today toward anarchy.com. It is of course, uh, um, June 7th. We're already into June. It's hard to believe such a weird year. Uh, you'll see there. Danny Panzella is my guest today. He's been on the show before. He's a good friend of mine. Uh, he's a, also a fellow anarchist. Of course, he's an activist. Uh, he was a member of we are change. One of the earliest founding members of we are change along with Luke Radowski. Uh, in New York, he's a Gothamite. I get to use that word. That's always cool. I like it when, when Danny comes around because I can use the word Gothamite. And, of course, that always reminds me of Batman, not necessarily New York. But Gothamite is actually a term coined for New Yorkers specifically, not, not, uh, not actual uh, Batman Gotham uh, denizens. Uh, Danny joins me this week to talk about the, the whole George Floyd thing, but in particular – you know, the protesting, the value of it, racism, institutionalized racism, how important it really is to talk about the racial aspect of it. Uh, you know that I speak about the police thing of it all the time. And so it's great. I think, uh, you know, I can, it, when I press the show to the social media today, I, you know, I, I'm always joking around. And I just said, you know, timely and topically topical that's that's not my strong point so what do i do i call in a friend if i don't know don't know what i'm talking about let me call in a friend and uh, when it comes to this racism thing i don't have a clue <laughs> i'm i'm white i'm as white as they can be uh, i i grew up in the city so i grew up around uh black people mexican people um uh, Chinese people japanese people i went to a large high school in the city where uh, people came from different parts of the world as part of work studies and things like that and and exchanges, students' exchanges. So, uh, you know, I have no problem in my lifetime. And I've been from one side of the nation to the other. I've actually been out of the nation. A lot of people never have. So I've seen different places, talked to different people, met different you – know, but I don't know racism. I'm not a racist myself. I didn't know um, words like the N word that was not a word that I was raised with. My family, the people that I was brought up around, didn't use language like that. Uh, that was language that I learned from black people, um, from black people who now say that I can't use that word, um, but I'm still singing those songs that you taught me those words in. So I'm not sure if you don't understand what I'm talking about Ice Cube, Ice T, guys like that. Um, N.W.A., um, Luke Skywalker. Uh, um, um, I, I, I'm trying. I'm just trying to think of all the old school back in the day, place it, groups types that crossed over with metal uh, and could be found in in those places. All alternatives to the mainstream, not alternative music. This is before alternative music. Um, alternatives to the mainstream at the time were metal music and rap music, and I listened to both as as a kid growing up. Uh, again, growing up in the city, having friends that were of of different descents and different places and different backgrounds, it was easy for me to do. Uh, it's one of my greatest compliments has been to have my own children grow up and them say to me that they they, they realize that I have one of the largest listening tastes uh, in general and and it's it's all of that it, when it comes to to music and it's all of that background of just having experienced different tastes you know my my um my mother raised me on rock and roll um but then she met a man who was into country and you know how that kind of thing happens so then i was exposed to country at a really young age and then of course the counterculture uh drugs 
um, getting into heavy metal, Dungeons and Dragons. I, I actually, really, I was quite a bit younger than that. I'd already doing that. Um, playing those games and, and reading the fantasy books and things like that. Um, but by the time, you know, by the time you get to, to high school where I grew up, I mean, you've experienced all of these, these different people and all of these, these different ideas. And so you don't grow up with these things. You have to, to learn them from somewhere. And it was the black kids and the Mexican kids. I didn't know any wiggers. Uh, if you call him that, I was I was a metal kid who just happened to have black and Mexican friends who listened to rap, and so that's where I heard it from. And it was it was the old school hardcore gangster rap um, that began it all. You know, it was the, it was the NWA's, it was the Easy E's, it was Ice, MF and T's. You know, <laughs> that's that's part of some lyrics. Um, so I I have this expanse and understanding of some cultures that I don't I'm not a part of in any way shape or form other than that that outside exposure but I know nothing about racism so it's an interesting conversation and and I, I like to poke a little bit of fun at Danny um, because I am an outsider to the conversation and because I can offer this conver- uh, offer this position and I, I mentioned a little bit about it last week, right? How I'm, I don't feel welcome at a Black Lives Matter protest for any number of reasons, the main one being that I'm white and I'm, I'm male. Um, but it also comes with the sort of look now. It was a little easier when I had hair. It was a little easier to fit in because I was an outcast. <laughs> If that makes any sense at all, you know, you didn't have long hair. It's, I don't even understand how this was even a thing. It doesn't seem to be such a thing anymore, clothing and, and those sorts of backgrounds. Maybe I'm so far removed from it, it doesn't seem that important. But, you know, when I was when I was in junior high school, when I was just starting junior high school, I had to have, you know, Jordans or I wasn't. You know, I wasn't included. I was, I was kind of an outcast. I mean, you really had to be. You had to have the, the. Well, I, I wasn't. Uh, I had some friends that had the Gucci stuff. I definitely was had a mix of interesting friends. I just, uh, I don't know. I, again, it was that that one of the greatest compliments was just that idea that I have such a a, a vast choice. A, a, a vast library to choose from in, in music. You could hear me listening to anything from classical to country. To, but that's uh, indicative of my entire sort of attitude toward life. And, and I learned some words and things that I, I wouldn't have ever known, I don't think, if it hadn't been for being introduced to that culture. So I was a little offended when when those artists that taught me those words came out and said I couldn't use them anymore. I was a little bit offended by that. Not that I ever did. Hey, let me light a cigar. I said, this is something I cured this week too. I mentioned it if I was going to do it. Mm, Yeah. You better believe that was a single stroke. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I got some more lighter fluid. And I filled up this Zippo that I just picked up. It was brand new at Walmart. It was just on sale. For some reason, it had been discounted. I don't know why. There was no particular reason. But it works great. I haven't had one in a while. I had to buy the lighter fluid. I had to find the lighter fluid. That's another one of those things. It's not as easy to find as it was a couple of months ago. So the cigar is lit. The ground is set. Danny Panzella joins me at 2 o'clock today, Central Time. So about 45 minutes from now. He couldn't do the, the halfway through thing that I usually do. So we will, we will spend the entire second hour with Danny talking about George Floyd, talking about protesting, racism, killer cops. Um, I'll have to ask him about his impression of COVID. That may, may be the first thing that we'll have to jump into just because I'm here in Topeka and I've talked about that. I've mentioned how things are are clearly, from my perspective, different here than they are in other places, particularly a big city. 
uh, like New York and Danny lives there. So I can ask him about, you know, what he he's seen. We won't dwell on it. I know we're all done with the COVID-19 story, have been for a long time, but I'm curious about this. I'm curious to know if, you know, cruise night's been going on for a month like it has here, that kind of thing, and, and watching it grow and, and the sort of grassroots. Danny's real close to the same age as I am, so he should he should remember some of these things that, Oh, we did when we were kids. I, it, it, there's so many more things for kids to do today, I guess. I, it, when when I was a kid growing up, we had, you know, at some point we had Atari and some point we had Nintendo. There wasn't that many distractions. We were we were doing things like reading books or playing in the yard or, uh, you know, as soon as we hit 15, 16 years old, racing cars and, and doing cruise night and things like that and uh, having that fun. And, and it's just a sort of interesting little throwback that, that I've seen happen since COVID. So I'll ask, I'll ask Danny a little bit about it. We won't dwell on it, like I said, though. And I shared some other things with you. TowardAnarchy.com, June 7th is what you're looking for. If you have to, go into the archive. I have everything updated. Uh, <laughs> that's not always true. If you go into the archive, it's 2020, it's June. You'll see the one one show so far, June 7th. Unless, it's, unless of course, it's really into the future. And I've done some more shows since then. I, I shared some other links, of course, some links for um, the stuff that Danny's working on. We'll catch up with uh, Sovereign in the City, which is his prod- project with his wife. Um, they have a new um, a podcast that they've been doing. In fact, that was one of the reasons that we had to sort of adjust today's schedule is because the, their podcast airs today. Uh, uh, Sovereign Love Stream is what it's called. And it's... Uh, uh, him and Vanessa, uh, his wife, um, just you know, uh, talking about their their relationship and and how they do it in in terms. We'll we'll, we'll get to the not how they do it. You perverts, man! You guys gotta stop thinking like that. As if you're really here. As if that wasn't in my own mind. It's funny watching. Um, uh, I I signed up this week for uh, HBO trial on Hulu. Just so I could, I could try to uh, binge uh, a bunch of stuff. Maybe even, even um, Game of Thrones. Possibly, I, I watched a couple episodes. I, I just don't know. I don't care to get that involved in those shows anymore. I, I prefer a couple hours at most. But I'll be, I'll be doing this HBO thing here um, uh, for a little bit. I think at least a month, and and so there'll be. Uh, any number of interesting little things that I should be coming across for entertainment things to talk about here re- uh, here in the next few weeks. I, I've even I've even watched some things I've already seen before. I, I've I've already been into it this week. I had to I had to clear my head to even think about it for a moment because because of the fact that I have just sort of vegged out a little bit this week on some TV. It's been kind of fun uh, because. The previ- well, even a lot of this week and almost all, all of last week, I spent so much time watching these protests and what was going on out there. And and so I had to I had to take a break and I saw they were pushing the trial of HBO. And I said, you know what? I could I could binge binge a little bit. We got lots to talk about. Go to toward and then come right back here after this break. We'll be back. I would have to say that the craziest thing that I saw this week was our own president uh, calling for uh, open war on the streets. Uh, it, I, it was, it was, I, I, it, the thing is, is that it, it was already a war. He just finally informed the American people that, that it's actually going on. It's kind of scary to, to watch him respond like this because it was a it was complete indifference on his part and and i have to say that i think uh, the proof of of handling the things best uh is exampled in denver uh, i think that they were if not the first one of the first to immediately after they had trouble uh say wait a minute let's back off Let's rethink this thing a little bit. And they sort of dropped back. And then the trouble sort of seemed to fade away 
And um, I, I stopped watching. I, 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 that's what I was saying before I went into the break. It's I, I just spent so much time watching it. I was doing this thing where I, you know, I have multiple screens and, and I'm watching, you know, I'm watching Dallas and I'm watching Houston and I'm watching Denver and I'm watching L.A. and San Francisco and D.C., Philadelphia. And, and, and unfortunately, still in all of those, I still, as a white man, never felt like I was particularly welcome in any of those places. Um, not really, because what was happening I watched it here too in Topeka. They had a couple of little marches and, and a couple of people got arrested and a couple of people broke the, the police station window and um, broke one of the bank's windows and some, a couple of things like that. So a little bit of damage and, you know, just some people acting out. Um, I, 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 I watched it here though. And there were no, there were no white people invited to speak. Nobody was handing the bullhorn to the white guy, um, even though there were some standing around and they were, you know, they had Black Lives Matter signs, too. And they were out there just as just as just like everybody else on the street doing, you know, I guess, whatever it is they're doing, protesting, rioting, looting, depending on, you know, some of them. They're not all one and the same. I hope you understand that. I, I hope that you're not one of these people that that can't separate the two i mean that may sound a little weird coming from a guy that wouldn't you wouldn't find out there either way because i wouldn't petition my government uh because i don't have a government i did i didn't vote for these people i didn't vote them in i don't think that that any of that particularly works although you've seen a little bit of action this is one of the things we'll have to talk about when danny gets here uh we did see that there was some result in so much as you know charges were levied and and not just against the the main officer, but the other three officers have been charged as well too, and they even bumped charges up at one point. And, uh, so you know, and that's probably I, you have to say that there's at least some um, influence from the the marches and the protests and the things that are going on that have brought this about. But it's not. It's it is my problem with the whole thing is it and and watching this and watching some of these um, meetings between um, whichever black individual stood up in the community um, with with the local sheriff or the local um, captain of the PD or whatever it is, you know, talking and and agreeing. And I, I just hear the same suggestions as solutions provided and and these are the things that they've been doing for years and years and nothing has stopped the the militarization militarization of the police nothing has stopped the the abusiveness of the police whether you're a white man whether you're a black man whether you're a poor man whether you're a rich man they don't really care once they have an excuse to uh, to start the process of, of, of robbing, caging, and or murdering you. Once they, whatever premise it is, uh, ha, they've, they've confirmed it, uh, then they can escalate. And, and if you try to resist them, they, it continues to escalate, and eventually they, they kill you, um, or they can. And this is what's happening a lot. It's happening 1,200 times or so a year so this one particular instance sets off this spark across the nation that I, I, I said this, I think was more related to the fact that everybody had been cooped up and inside than it was any self-righteous notion of another black man killed by police because I just, I, or just another man killed by police. Listen, uh, all those marches, uh, listening to all those people talk, listening to them do their group think speeches where they say their name, George Floyd. What's their name, George? Floyd, you know that stuff. Not once did I hear Kelly Thomas. Don't I don't feel welcome. That's the topic of conversation. We'll be about half an hour. Danny Penzo will be joining me. We'll, some of the things we'll talk about, all in and around that general topic and everything that's going on 
with the protests and and racism and uh, just man, so much to cover. Start it at TowardAnarchy.com. We're going to jump into this break here any second now. There's the music. I knew it was coming. Hey, I'm paying attention for once. I'll tell you what's going on. I'll share some links with you. I'll share a quote with you all when we get back right here on Toward Anarchy. It's a great cartoon scene. It's one of the great movie scenes. I have uh, a South Park going on in the background, as I often do. In fact, it's often always South Park. Uh, it's just easy because I have the Blu-rays. I just drop one in, and they'll play for for you know a few hours really easily, and and I don't have to worry about it. it's just going on. But that's one of the one of the truly great scenes. It's the uh, fight uh, between uh, uh, the crippled kids on the show, and it's the they duplicate the fight scene um, from They Live uh, when. Uh, when Nada and uh, oh, what's the other character's name? Why don't even why don't why don't I know? Why, why is it not coming to me? I know Nada's name, but I don't. Which they never even say in the in the movie. I know George Nada's name, but I don't know. I can't, why am I not? Uh, why is it not coming to me? Uh, well, David Keith's character anyway. He uh, um. Uh, they they get in this amazing fight in the alley. If a lot of people are familiar with it, you're probably familiar with it. And you're probably going, Jesus, he's butchering this thing. He doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. Because I wasn't thinking about it. It just popped up on the screen. They're in that fight. And I know that what they did for the scene in South Park is that they duplicated the fight from from uh, They Live, the, the fight scene from They Live. And it's just classic. It's just a brutal fight. It just It, it just looks mean. Uh, they really just lay into each other. It's just a great classic fight scene. Got to see it. Uh, if you've never seen They Live, uh, you're missing out anyway because They Live is is the the metaphor for our reality, uh, the manipulation behind the scenes, the the control, uh, the selling out of the elite to. In this case, it's an it's an alien race, but um, you know that's that's the metaphor for um, really our entire existence. It's so fitting today. It's you know thirty years old or something like that, and and it's still so perfect today. So you could drop it in to any. It is. It's foundational. That's a good way to put it. That's a good word to use. Foundational. It's it's one that I think anyone who's you know, awake woke whatever it, it probably needs to watch you should have it in your library because for a lot of reasons i mean that that core story about the manipulation and control from uh that um you know the the lizard people it, it, there's so much of it that applies across the board when you're talking about uh the manipulation and people's understanding and how they, it's like the matrix in that sense. It's it, <laughs> all right. Stop it. We're obviously we're on the same page. It's but I was not looking at that when I said that, but uh, 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 producer Ken just said the same thing. It's like the matrix, just as I was saying, and he was typing it out on the screen. <laughs> it really, <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, in that sense, it really is important about about the matrix because it gives you an idea of all different sides and impressions and how one of the big things is how how uh, what great lengths they they will go to to cover up their crimes, to cover up uh, the the coercion to, to, you know, whether whether there's aliens or lizard people or not behind it those those other things exist it's it's part of this weird reality that gets really confusing i gotta be i gotta be real careful about how i say this it gets real confusing when you add virtual reality to it because we already live in a virtual reality model in so many ways and i'm not even talking about like the potential of our universe being that i'm i'm just talking about in our reality, the, the different levels of control 
and the different layers of existence that sit on top of our reality and weigh us down, um, w- whether it's you know government or religion or any number of institutionalized ideas or or institutions, things that have been have been ingrained in our beliefs and and for so long we have no control over it we only we we can only hope to control ourselves and the and the things that the, the impression that it leaves upon us and and unfortunately what happens i think with all of these the matrix they live um man there are so many others some of, some of those that are really great right on but those those two are are hugely popular within in the movement fight club is another one um the things that it that, that the core importance of that is you know, preying on the naive and innocent that's it that's a very very good way to look at it um because that's what's happening they that's that's it right um uh, independence day that's another one that's a really good example of it because they're actually an external invading force. They drop in and they're like, right away, they say, look, we're harvesting. And, and that's also a metaphor for the, the elite. I hate using that word for so many reasons, but let's just stick with it. The elite, the government, the controllers, the manipulators, those people, you know, what I'm talking, they, them, they're perfect metaphors for them because they are leeches. They literally suck the life right out of us. Um, our money, our health, our wealth, uh, our reality, the, the entirety of our reality and, and the way most people think is controlled. But it's, it's, it's weird how people will only apply authority at, at, at certain times. You know, they'll, they'll do what they want all the time, and they'll say that they can do whatever they want all the time. But then all of a sudden, it's usually when it comes to somebody else. That's usually where it happens. When it comes to somebody else's freedom or what somebody else is doing that they presume to be bad, then all of a sudden they lose that that independence that notion that they have the right, if you will, if you want to use that word, to do whatever they want to do. And and more power to them when they do it with other people and they do it voluntarily and those things produce real wealth and real results that, that improve the world. So it's, it's insane that people don't think about it. Well, um, let me try to give you an example of this because this is this is something that uh, I want to say it. I guess a smart mind. I hate using that because I don't like to think of myself in those terms. Um, uh, that something that a smart mind struggles with, uh, an intelligent person struggles with, and that's trying to understand other people. We get it on a core level. We get we can get it on a basic level. I'm not I'm not talking about like super intelligent, like beyond us kind of people that are almost autistic and and really don't understand people. I'm talking about normal intelligent people that understand people that just kind of get life, and that's most of us, I think, for the most part. And then some of us take it a step further, uh, take it to another level. And and so I've always been very empathetic. I feel I feel people's pain. I get it on that basic level. But then when I apply logic to it, when I apply reason to it, a little bit of rhetoric, some language, some study, some critical thinking, it breaks down for me what they're doing, whatever they're supporting, the reason they're behaving the way they are. It breaks down for me because 
I, I've discussed this before, how I try to approach everything in life in the same way. It's not formulaic. I don't have a seven steps or, or a seven habits or anything like that. I probably should. Maybe, maybe it would help organize things a little bit better, but you know, whatever. It's just that I know that you can't get from A to Z without saying B, C, D, E, F, G, and all the rest of the, the letters in between. And so I don't tend to skip steps when I, when I come to approaching something new or that I've never done before. So I'm never afraid to try something new because I already understand that steps step by step this is going to have to be done before you can do this before you do this and i can't if it's something new so i'll have to turn my attention to it. i'll have to think about it i have to develop those things so it's not any any planned out thing it's just an outlook on life it's an i it's an idea that i can accomplish anything i want to accomplish barring physical or mental incapacity or or a, a a required level of physical or mental capacity that I'm, I'm not capable of reaching. And I don't know what those are. Physical are much more obvious. I'm not going to be able to lift that or move that over there. Intellect is, is harder to define. Even if you try to test it, it's, it's so much harder to define because it can manifest itself in so many different ways. Um, from spoken to written to, creativity whether you say it yourself or whether you produce it for someone else to say it. there's so many levels of it that it's so much harder to to track and trace and and that's all hard enough to deal with and live with and try to accept in your reality but then to also try to be empathetic and to understand someone else's position it's why i can't get behind uh, sort of the Black Lives Matter movement. It, it, to me, all I see is the racial division. I don't see anything beyond that, and 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 this is why because I've looked at it and I go, all right, I get that. I get. I understand the protesting. I understand that cops shouldn't beat people. I understand that black people seem to take a greater brunt of being abused by the state and by the cops and by. Uh, uh, just the system in general. I understand that, but here I start to apply the logic to it. All right, well, but if I participate in this, if I do this, if I if I wave this banner, wave this flag, then I alienate this particular subset of people that I'm trying to reach, and it's the larger subset of the people that I'm trying to reach in the case of racism. So why the hell do you do it? Why are you doing it? And I get the passion, and I get the the emotion, I get the logic, except that when it comes to, all right, I thought about it, here it is, stop right there, don't go any further, because if we go this next step, if we take this next step, we lose the greater, uh, the, 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 the upper, having the upper hand of the argument, whatever, whatever it is, how, you lose that position. It's it's dismissing everything that you just talked about. It's saying, um, well, anyway, as I was saying, on and on, um, fillers, it's empty. It dismisses what was previously said. It, there's there's so many things w wrong with the whole idea of skipping uh, the, the B through Y. <laughs> you, know, you, you to get from A to Z, you got to go through B through Y, and if you do that in those logical steps, and you see that that the results, I guess here's here's the problem, and this is why it will never work for me, and we'll we'll continue this conversation with Danny when he joins us in about fifteen minutes. Is that they're calling all of these people? This is what I started to say a little bit ago with the um, you know, sort of people meeting with the sheriffs or the mayors or whatever. They're talking about making changes. They're talking about passing legislation. They're talking about doing the same things that we've done over and over and over again that haven't stopped the police state, that haven't stopped it from growing. It hasn't stopped the police and communities and the, and the, the governments 
uh, in communities from acquiring weapons of war to put onto our streets. It hasn't stopped. Um, it, it, look, any of these people, any individual could have potential racial uh, racist tendencies. I, I th- we probably all do, whether we want to admit it or not. Uh, and they're probably simply because so many things are labeled racist, <laughs> but but these tendencies can be kept to you, yourself, them, themselves, if they're not forced on us by government, by law, by institution. These would be. You know, my arguments for why this doesn't work, we're not we're not changing anything. You tell me you're going to go have police take sensitivity training. It's it's funny because all of it. It's like all of a sudden, all of the years of police. It, there's there's like a headline. says something about cities now talking about defunding police. Give me a break. It's not going to happen. You're not going to suddenly, after all this time, after all these years, after growing the police state, this one incident all of a sudden is going to stop the growth of the police state. There's not going to be a police state anymore. It, it, that's that. I think that's the fantasy that a lot of people are, are resting on when they see what's happening now. They They see change develop through action on the street except that they don't see that there's not that many people on the street in comparison to everybody else the truth is that when it comes to ending uh you know the police state it would take ending policing that i've talked about before it would take a major change in the fundamental idea of why they are there at all on the street or why they are allowed to pull us over to change any of it at all. Just a little bit of training. That's not going to fix anything. Uh, One more law. That's not going to change anything. A prosecution of a cop over here. That's fine. Uh, Until qualified immunity is gone. There's absolutely no hope. At least there's some movement to, to get rid of qualified immunity. But again, that's a symptom of the greater problem of the general idea that authority has the right to create these laws and tell us what to do. Hey, we'll be right back on Toward Anarchy. Danny Panzella right now is talking with his wife, Vanessa. They're doing their live uh, podcast that they just started here recently, and we'll talk to him about that when he joins the show here in just about five minutes. Um, they are talking about the um, the PSYOP tricks played on us by our egos and how they can disrupt and interfere uh, with our relationships, those those uh, one-on-one personal relationships, and I can I can just imagine what that is because I know um, what it means to keep an ego in check and to keep your mouth shut in a relationship and not to continue to push the buttons. That's why I have a 25 year old relationship, um, unmarried, no sort of bonds like that. We didn't ask for anybody's permission, but we have three children. We have a nice, happy home. Um, it, we we speak to each other. We uh, enjoy each other's company. We spend a good majority of our time together. And a lot of it has to do with understanding when to keep your mouth shut. You it just not don't say it. Don't say it. It it doesn't it doesn't matter if it's true. It doesn't matter if it's the way you happen to feel at the moment. Sometimes you just keep your mouth shut, and that's okay. Uh, and then the rest of the times you need to talk, but make sure that you're speaking from a place of of understanding and uh, a place of acceptance. Because if you're talking from that place of ego, man, you are looking for. You're looking for a fight. So I just imagine what that conversation is about because I've been there. I, I, let me do a couple of things. TowardAnarchy.com. It's June 7th. I'll tell you about the links up there. We have links to Sovereign in the City website uh, as well as to follow Danny and Vanessa on uh, uh, and Sovereign in the City on Twitter. I have uh, a link there just for producer Ken today. 
it's the Slay at Home Festival on YouTube. It's one part of it. Um, it's hours and hours of metal music. It's just a, an overload of, of different, uh, a, a wide range of metal tastes through it. And, and some of the stuff I assume is pre-recorded. Some of it is, is being played uh, live at the, at the time. Uh, that they're airing the stuff, but there's many, many hours of it. And that was just, I think maybe the second um, version of it. And I just, I knew the second, I, it was one of those things I turned it on and I was just, Oh wow. Uh, just the different, all the different flavors of, of different, because it's not like it's, you know, slay at home festival and, and it's metal music. It says it's metal music, but there's, you have to understand the subtlety of the metal music uh, and its ties, its relationship with uh, with classical music, and and uh, how um, how it can be melodic and slow, but still powerful and still be considered metal music. And so there's just this huge range, and it's hours and hours of stuff that you could throw on in the background while you're while you're doing the gardening or working in the garage, working around the house, or building the website, whatever it is you're having to do, um, man, you could definitely do it with that music playing in the background and make you very, very happy to fill up the rest of your day. That cue, that music right there, means that we're about to hit the top of the hour, and that means that Danny Panzella, my, de- my guest, is joining us next. We'll talk about George Floyd, the protesting, the racism, the killer cops. We'll cover it all uh, as, as the uh, subject demands as we get to it. And we'll be right back on Toward Anarchy. Okay. Uh, we're off into hour number two. As always, thank you for sticking around. I really appreciate it. Go to TowardAnarchy.com and click on today's date. It's June 7th, and you will see that the guest today is Danny Panzella. He's a friend of mine, a uh, fellow anarchist. He's an activist. He's a documentary film producer. Uh, he's a Gothamite. He's also a geek. Um, he's into to comic books and uh, Spider-Man and <laughs> just all of some of the things that, that I like. So we have that in common as well. Uh, he's a family man, um, uh, truther, a lot of things. <laughs> but what he is in, in, in uh, terms of, of what we need today, I think, is someone who can can talk to us a little bit about the the racism, about the protesting. Uh, he had talked to us a little bit about some of the things that I admit I don't know about. It's not part of my lexicon. I I have not experienced racism so much. I did actually once have a black guy. Uh, call, okay, awesome. Danny's calling in right now. Um, uh, I did actually have a, a black guy call me a racist name once. Um, uh, it was kind of surprising. I returned the favor. It was the only time that I've ever done that. It's not the only time I've ever used the word. I've, I've said that over and over again. Uh, uh, musically, I've said the word, I don't know how many times, singing those songs growing up in my, my youth. Um, and like I said, I didn't learn that word from from white people. Uh, I learned that word from black people, uh, black musicians, uh, artists. Um, OK, uh, that's cool. Good. Danny's here. Uh, you know, there's there's so much to talk about in in terms of racism that I admit I don't know about. And so that's what I do when when I have something I need to talk about, something that I want to share with you. I bring in somebody else who can help me me discuss it, and uh, Danny, being a good friend, is always happy to do that. And of course, I'm always I'm always poking at him a little bit. We we keep each other on our toes. It's one of the things that a lot of us do. You know, if we we see each other using language or words or or ideas that might just be a little bit questionably on the. Uh, um, socialist statist communist side we sort of get to you know what what are you saying there you know what what exactly is it you're hitting at there buddy are you uh you slipping you fall out and and it's a legitimate thing for us to do i think because i'm sitting here playing this is why i didn't do this now i realize this is exactly why i didn't do this i don't i don't keep the zippo because it's like 
the original fidget toy for me. Same with um, uh, butterfly knives. I can do them with both hands and with the Zippo. I can do the the real quick. I can do the snap. I can do the flip. Uh, I could so I'm sitting here fidgeting with it and it's making noise. So I'm throwing it across the room. So uh, <laughs> let me bring Danny into the conversation. And uh, we have so much to talk about. Like I said, he's a geek and uh, he's in he's in Gotham. So we have to talk about uh, one of the things we have to talk about is a little bit of the COVID-19 thing. So uh, if you haven't met him before, if you, you didn't catch him the last time he was on the show, uh, let me introduce you to my friend Danny Panzella. Danny, thank you so much for joining me, brother. I know you just got done with your show, uh, so I appreciate you jumping right on the phone and joining me. Oh, no problem. I'm happy to be here. I always like having conversations with you, Mike. Oh yeah, you're one of my favorite people to talk to. You challenge me, that's for sure, and and I like to be challenged. I was just telling the listener uh, that you were were having a conversation on your show uh, with your wife about uh, ego and about uh, keeping that ego in check. And boy, I tell you, it's one of those things that I know as a, as someone who's in a long term uh, relationship. Uh, with the same woman and family man and we're you know we're not married we don't have any of those imaginary bind, binds uh to us anything like that uh that keeping the ego in check is one of those things that has made our relationship work absolutely i mean you have to um you know we're not really married either because we're both anarchists we don't believe in asking the state for permission for us to have a relationship or we don't need the blessing of the state uh so <laughs> you know i'm with you but we are in a committed long-term relationship, and we consider each other life partners. Um, and one of the most important things, the lessons that we had to learn, and believe me, we, we went through a lot of hard stuff to, to lesson. We went through years of turmoil and real toxicity where I, you know, I spent nights in jail because of the fights we had. So we went to that wow. dark place, um, and we had to choose to get our egos under control um, and work together as a couple to heal ourselves individually and, and heal each other and, and help guide each other and hold each other accountable um, to heal so that we could improve our relationships. And, you know, our relationship is amazing now. And that's not to say uh, we don't have conflicts. We had a conflict this week that we just discussed on the show where my ego got out of control and I allowed it to put up some walls between us. And, um, you know, that's that's one of the most dangerous things to a relationship. But, you know, for the most part, I'm able to keep it under control now. You know, it's been a couple of years that I've been practicing this. So, but, you know, you're never, you're never perfect. This is a lifelong, um, you know, mission to kind of... Um, and, and I don't like to bash the ego either because I think the ego has a place. It's, you know, its job is to protect us. Um, sometimes it protects us from the wrong people. You know, sometimes it's trying to protect us because it, the ego or the reptilian brain can't see um, the same way that our conscious mind sees, right? So it views people, it puts people into like archetypal categories. So mm. basically it views you as, it views outsiders as either someone who wants to attack, someone who um, is going to nurture you like a parent, um, someone who you want to mate with uh, like a partner, these are kind of the, some of the categories. There, there are two others, and I don't remember what they are. There's five total. Um, and I guess this comes out of Freudian psychology. But basically, right. this, is, this is how the, the reptilian brain, the, the primal brain, sees people. And so when your wife says something that kind of annoys you or raises your hackles, your reptilian brain doesn't know the difference, That doesn't realize this is your wife. It says, that's a threat. That person's threatening you. So... Then it, it activates the ego to to say, "Hey, what are you doing threatening <laughs> threatening me?" Right, <laughs> and that's why we end up arguing with our partners instead of just you know uh, resolving conflicts with discussion. But sorry, that was like a little mini rant there. <laughs> no, no, I I'm absolutely fascinated by the topic. It's an interesting thing uh, for me in particular in our relationship, my wife and I. Uh, because we've never we had one time in just the earliest, earliest of our relationship where we actually had this sort of argument where we yelled at each other and let that sort of ego 
jump out of us. And after that, we ne- we never did that again. We were, you know, we were done with it. Uh, and that was early in our relationship. So uh, it's it's interesting. And, and it's one of the reasons why I call I consider myself lucky and why I try not to compare my own relationship to other people. I try not to do that at, at all. I try to compare myself to other people because I, I don't want them. I, I don't want them to think that I think that I'm better than they are, <laughs> even if even or if worse. the reality. <laughs> what's that or worse? Don't, you don't. You also don't want to compare yourself in another way where you're. You feel like all oh, my relationship isn't as good as that person. Right. As long right, as right. you're doing the best you can, then you know there's no need for any type of judgment. I'm so, oh, that's a good way to put it. I like that. <laughs> that's a <laughs> tough thing to do, man. That's a tough place to to live. Yeah, uh, that's a that's it takes being really consciously aware of who you are and your space in the world and how it impacts other people as you go through everything you do. Because, uh, I mean, unless you live just sort of out in the middle of nowhere with nobody else around you, a a lot of what you do in any given day, a lot of what you say at any given time impacts the people that are around you. And 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 it. A lot of times it can be negative, especially if you're negative. I mean, they can already assume it's negative with that, you know, without it being negative. So, no, I, I appreciate that you guys are doing that. I really, I really think that's a great thing. Uh, I wish that my wife would join me in conversing, but she's not. She's not the type. Not like you know. This. It took it took Vanessa a while to to feel comfortable, and I still she's not she's still not totally comfortable with it, but. Um, she is committed to doing it, and even though she feels a little shy about it at times, um, you know, she's really putting herself out there and challenging herself to do it. But, you know, uh, if anybody is interested in checking out the show, if you don't mind me, just give myself a little plug. No, absolutely. Com. You just what check us it? out on SovereignLoveStream.com. SovereignLoveStream.com. And I have the links up there for everybody. If you go to TowardAnarchy.com, you look for June 7th, uh, you you have the link right there to the Sovereign in the City website, uh, which, of course, you can get to everything that uh, Danny is yes. up to from there. Also, uh, Twitter link for you as well. So, yeah, Sovereign we in the make City sure. is basically our blog about how to live off the grid even in the city. And even if you can't live 100% off the grid, but at least just to be able to reduce your dependency on the grid. So it's a lot of agorism and anarchist philosophy and how you can apply it to your everyday life um, so that you're not so dependent on the control grid. And and that's something that you can obviously speak to. I've been using the word Gothamite uh, to describe you as someone who who uh, lives in, in New York, not someone who lives in, in Batman land, uh, even <laughs> though uh, <laughs> even though you're a geek like me and you probably uh, I, Spider-Man's your favorite, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Spider-Man is yeah. Superman. Yeah, I, I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm a Batman guy myself, Batman and Wolverine. So, uh, but I think that <laughs> knowing each other, those are probably both apt and fitting, right? <laughs> yeah, <for> sure, <laughs> no question about it. Uh, it. So, tell me this, then, since you live in in Manhattan or where you live in you live in uh, uh, New in York, Brooklyn. there, and you, you, you're in yeah. the big city. Um, yep, you're in a I'm bigger in the city than. What's that? I'm in a state of tell hole. <laughs> state of tell hole. Yeah, well, we all are, and I, and mine's just mine just happens to be much smaller than yours, and that's been a a, a question, a conversation I've been having, uh, you know, as as the COVID nineteen thing is going on. Just to touch on that a little bit, I wanted to know personally you, what you saw there, what you're seeing there as we're transitioning back, because here in in Topeka, Kansas, you know. It seemed pretty normal for quite a while now, for at least a month now. Uh, things have seemed pretty normal. People were back on the street. Uh, but the stores were generally open. There's some odd things. You know, stores close earlier. There's still a few stores I see that are still closed. And I'm like, why the hell is that store closed? But uh, I think that's considerably different for uh, the cities. But, that, you know, I don't know. Um, well, New York City is still on lockdown. Um, they are just beginning now. On Monday, um, a few um, stores can now retail stores can open up again um, for the first time since March. But they they aren't allowed to. You're not allowed to go into the stores. Everything is curbside pickup. So basically, what 
what a lot of the restaurants that have been allowed to be open through the whole thing, what they have done was they set up little desks or, or, or tables right at the door. They move the register to the door, and you basically just come up to the door, and you can place an order and then and pay and take it to go. Obviously, you know, you weren't allowed to sit in the restaurant. Um, now, as of tomorrow, Monday, they're going to allow retail stores to open up again. Um, so far, it's, you know, f- through the lockdown, only Target and Walgreens and, and like, the major uh, retailers were allowed to be open. And I guess the rationalization is that these stores are usually big box stores. They're, they're large, so there's enough room to social distance within the store as opposed to a small mom and pop shop that everybody would have to crowd into. Um, I'm assuming that's what the logic yeah. is. But um, so things are just starting to open up. We're still not going to be allowed to go into stores, but we'll be able to, you know, uh, do the curbside pickup thing. Um, and we'll see. I mean, they, they, we have been on curfew for the last couple of, uh, I guess the last week because of the protest where everybody's supposed to be in at eight o'clock. But honestly, um, they're not really enforcing it. Um, they're only really enforcing it against protesters. Uh, and, sure. and, you know, in honestly, in minority neighborhoods. Um, so, and although my neighborhood is a mixed neighborhood, it's, it's, I mean, I have $2 million Victorian homes on one block and then large apartment buildings on the next block. Um, but because of kind of the, the, so many, I guess, of the wealthy people, it's not really enforced here. But a couple of blocks north where it's a much, you know, poorer neighborhood and also larger minority population it is enforced i mean police were through the whole lockdown police were beating down people um of course people of color for not wearing masks but i I walk around my neighborhood without a mask the only i carry a mask with me only because you can't go into a business without uh, i you know i couldn't go into the store without wearing a mask so i would carry it with me in case i needed to go into a store but I'm not. I'm not walking around with masks on. But I'm looking out the window right now. There's, there's people. There's a few people with no masks, and there's a lot of people still wearing masks. So, you know, I think I think it's a lot of it is personal um, choice. You know, some people are legitimately afraid, and you know, I don't. I don't think they have anything really to be afraid of, or unless they're immune compromised. But you know, it's not up to me to decide what. If people are comfortable wearing the mask, I guess you know they're, they're free to do that. Yeah, I, I mean, it doesn't sound like it's too different there, uh, except that you just looking at the, the greater population, and so there's just the larger concern of so many people, because everything yeah. you said is consistent with what I've seen here, except that we, you know, there's that sort of Midwest attitude that I think, the, you know, especially here, it's, it's um, uh, you know, it's gun-toting rednecks for the most part. Uh, you know, you're not going to keep them locked down for for too long. Uh, so for more than a month now, really, probably about five weeks, uh, it's really seemed like it was much more more normal. We always had the, the curbside thing right away. Um, they immediately, it's funny, uh, you know, they immediately threw out some laws and changed some legislation to make it so you could sell liquor on street corners and stuff like that. It's, Isn't that it's crazy? Ridiculous. There's yeah. no concern about health, but th- that's the one thing that they did was make it so now everybody can drink to the street. <laughs> yeah. That's a strange thing. <laughs> we, we can't say that vitamin C can cure or help your immune system, but we can drink alcohol on the corner. <laughs> <laughs> and you can buy it right out of the corner. And you could drive right up and pick it up. Yeah. Uh, do, you, do they I mean, have look, drive up great. liquor stores? It's- no, no. But, but yeah, I mean, it's you, guys don't, the same thing. you guys don't have drive up liquor stores? No, no, not, okay. not, not I mean, that's a thing in 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 other states. It's a real thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I'm all for it. I'm all for the freedom. I think it's great that yeah. they're not, you know, that that people are are buying alcohol. I just think it's, um, you know, and that there's less restrictions. Um, but I just think it's ironic that they're claiming that this whole thing is about health and lockdown and all that. But you know, alcohol, which lowers your immune system, is well, they, they made it easier to buy that. That and, you know, how long were those rules or regulations that kept that from happening in place and why, when in the worst time of crisis, when everything is so bad, now all of a sudden we don't need that protection, that law? Right, um, right. How did that happen? <laughs> I know. It's it's 
mind-boggling. That the the that the fact that they don't see their own hypocrisy is mind-boggling. Well, I think that's really truly the answer is that they do see their own hypocrisy and that they don't really give a damn. I think yeah. that's well, really I'm more sure realistic. <laughs> From the politician's perspective, I think you're absolutely right. I think for for you know voters, people who you know, oh, no. especially during this, Democratic voters, people who consider mm. themselves liberals, they kind of miss the hypocrisy of it. You know, I've got people in my Facebook neighborhood group telling me that I'm a crackpot for you know <laughs> being pro holistic medicine, and these of same course. people are the ones buying margaritas and drinking them on the corner while they're supposed to be protecting their health. They, they're well, you're the not going to take that. health advice from that guy, that's for sure. Hey, we got to go right? into a break. Hold that thought. We will be right back on Toward Anarchy with Danny Panzella. So this is the short segment. So this guy this guy will kill us. He always does. We start getting into something good and time to jump right back into a break. But, you know, you got to pay the bills somehow. Uh, trust me, this whole uh, running a network thing, it's a lot of hard work, and it's a lot of money, and it's a lot of time, and it's a lot of energy, and I'm glad I don't have to do it. I'm glad I just get to sit here and talk. Um, so, it, it, you know, you, uh, it, you, 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 the listener, it's going to be incumbent upon you to uh, participate in this thing. You have to like, you have to share, you have to follow along. Uh, you have to subscribe. You have to do all of those things that make it so this information gets out there, whether it's the network website, whether it's my website. And if you go to TowardAnarchy.com today, you'll see my guest is Danny Panzella, my friend, an anarchist, an activist, and filmmaker, and uh, Gothamite. I just love getting to use that word. It just immediately brings Batman to mind for me. I shared his uh, website up there, the Sovereign in the City website. I think it's just an easy way for you to uh, keep up with Danny uh, and what he's got going on. That includes the Sovereign Love Stream podcast that uh, he and his wife have been doing here for a little bit now and really starting to feel it. It's amazing. You got uh, you got a lot of irons in the fire. How do you even keep everything going? You're a family man. You have a, a son and uh, just so much going on. Uh, I, how do you even manage to do it all, really? <laughs> well, you know, I don't. <clears throat> I don't. A lot of, you know, a lot of my projects have taken a back seat, uh, especially since I'm a parent. Um, you know, my documentary, I still haven't finished editing it. And, you know, I, I, it's, I'm really lax on that, uh, honestly. But, you know, I'm hoping to move into a, a new financial um, position where I am able to fund the rest of that and get that documentary out. I have so many hours of great footage and great information that it's really a shame if, if that uh, film doesn't get finished. Um, oh, yes, yes. Yeah, would, and you yeah, helped okay. me out. You, you helped yeah. me film on some of those, uh, some of those great interviews. So, yeah, and, uh, get yeah it would be great to see, to see that come together. You have to let me know if there's something I can help you, you with on that, if there's some editing or any of that post stuff or anything that will help make that, uh, happen. I'd be I'd be glad to do that. But um, let's. Um, hey, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Anytime, brother. Um, let's talk about. Uh, we, let's set the conversation up. We're going to go to a break in, in just a couple of minutes. But let's set up the conversation that that we want to have here. Uh, you know, we're always poking some little jabs at each other and keeping each other on our toes and stuff. And and it usually comes to things that um, um, it can can border on. Uh, the socialist, the statist, the things that oh hey, hey what are you saying there? You know, you watch out, you step back. You're you're coming too close to the edge of being authoritarian there, uh, and, and and that's a good thing because what happens is that we see um, we see people, especially in times of crisis, whether it's COVID or whether it's um, the protests on the street, uh, people who claim to have a certain view on life uh, that that suddenly they're backing ideas and, and things that, that don't sound like they, they're consistent with those views. And so um, it, it comes to question a little bit. 
it, it helps to question a little bit, I think, each other uh, to make sure that we know that we're still being consistent. And I, and I thought that was important because it was one thing that you'd said to me before that, that you found me to be very consistent in my views on things. And so I, I approached this conversation with a um, with a soft touch because I, I don't want to say anything to sound like I'm dismissive of – of racial matters at all. I am, I am lacking in knowledge of racial matters because I am a white man. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that's, first of all, it's really an important thing to be able to admit that as white men, we don't understand how racism affects people on a daily basis. And honestly, it wasn't until I was in an interracial relationship. For those who don't know, my wife is Mexican. And <clears throat> for years, she would come home from work. She worked in, time, uh, in Times Square, in uh, Rockefeller Center, actually. Um, and she worked for Time, Inc., the giant mega media corporation. Mm-hmm. And she worked for a TV show that if I said the name, you'd all know it. Mm-hmm. And she would experience racism almost on a daily basis to the point of she would come into work and she would tell me these stories, and I would think she's just being oversensitive. Oh, come on, you're just being oversensitive. That, mm-hmm. that can't be. Like, people aren't that racist anymore. Yeah, I know KKK is that racist, but, you know, like, most people aren't, like, that racist. And so she would <laughs> tell me stories. She would get to work, and there'd be a group of, like, executives kind of, like, just hanging around and, like, maybe sitting on her desk. And she would approach, like, to come sit down, and they would oh, okay. oh, so hold it. Stop. Hold okay. that thought. We've got to go into this break. We'll, we'll come right sure. back. I hate to do it. Oh. No, it's okay. okay. <laughs> you are tuned in to the Republic Broadcasting Network. Visit our website by going to republicbroadcasting.org. We went off to the break. Danny was telling us about um, the fact that he's a white man. I'm a white man. And that he was introduced to racism through uh, his wife and the reality of it and in so much as that she would experience it at, in her workplace. And we're talking about sort of, uh, um, you know, a large uh, corporation, um, um, big executives. And so you were just talking about that before we went to the break. So, you know, and this is this is supposed to be like this big New York City liberal place media you know it's a lot of liberals there so she would come into work and there'd be a bunch of executives sitting around her desk or sitting on top of her desk and she would approach like um you know hey this is you know i'm i like i'm I'm coming to work and they would move out of her way to let her get the garbage they thought she was the cleaning lady and so they were like handing her the garbage can so she could empty it for them it was like ridiculous and you know at first i was like nah come on you have to be misinterpreting and it took years of her coming and telling me these stories i I mean i could go into a lot more of those stories but the point is that as a white man i don't see these things around me i don't notice them um it took being in an interracial relationship and her sharing these stories with me for years for me to finally realize oh wow you know this is what it's like so and I get it. I get that statism is a big part of the problem. And I am anti-state, and there is never, you will never hear me calling for a statist solution to the problem. But to pretend that when, if we got rid of the state, that the problem of racism disappears, um, is I, I just think it's incorrect. Um, yes, I, you know, you shared that meme earlier or, or a couple of days ago about if there's no institution, then there can be no institutional racism. And, of course, I 100% agree. We would lessen the amount of violence by getting rid of the state, and that includes racial violence. However, all of a sudden, the people that are racist, the people that don't respect the natural sovereign rights of people who have darker skin than them, are not going to all of a sudden say, oh, well, there's no more state, so I'm not going to be racist anymore. Uh And, unfortunately, our country... I shouldn't say unfortunately. Our country is 70% white. So they make up a majority, right? So 30% of of, uh, the minorities are not going to all of a sudden be treated fairly in the absence of government, just just because there's no government, by that 
whatever percentage, I don't know what the percentage is of that 70% white people that are actually racist. I, that I don't know. No, I don't think anybody could know. But I think that white people don't understand sometimes how things that benefit us don't benefit people of color. And we just take it for granted. It's almost like white society is the default. And we've been led to believe that because of democracy. It's really right. statism that kind of has put that idea in our head that the majority should rule. The majority, it, like, that's society should be, like, uh, should pander to or should be tailored to the most, making the most amount of people happy, right? So right. it's not that I think that white people are intentionally racist or, or the most people. Obviously, if you're joining the KKK or some kind of racist group like that, you're intentionally racist and, you know, you got a lot of internal work to do on your ego. But there's a lot of people that may not be racist. They may not consciously say, I think people of color or, or a black person is lower than me, has less, right, less rights than me. But if you believe that I want the world to be the way I want it to be, and you happen to be white, there may be issues that you don't even realize take away from the rights of people of color. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. No, I, absolutely. I, I don't. It, we it, and let's be. We have to be clear about this. We don't disagree really on any of these things. Uh, we're just having this conversation for for really a, a, a clarification across the board uh, on these ideas for everybody. Because I think I, I think that is what a, a lot of people think is that if you eliminate the state, a lot of problems go away, or that if you if you keep the state in place, a lot of problems stay away. It's it's wrong on on both both sides right. and so my problem with this always comes down to is that we never ever get to the the conversation where we can actually change something see here's what happens for me i'll, I'll give you a perfect example and i, I have to use me uh, because i can't use anybody else so sure. uh, the last couple of weeks we have these protests going on we have the george floyd thing going on and and george floyd um as 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 horrible as it is, is one of only, you know, is, is only one of 400 people that have been killed already this year. There's no particular by by police. Um, and, and they're, you know, they're kind of slow this year. Everything slowed down a little bit this year because of COVID-19. Uh, sure. and, and so there's no particular reason why his uh, uh, violate, you know, his being violated should be any any any. Thing, any reason to set off any particular protest or to set these changes in motion that we're supposedly seeing right now or hopefully seeing out of it. Um, it it's, I think it's probably mostly to do with the people have been cooped up for the last few months and they've been, they felt yeah. locked down and this is, is so they're exploding a little bit. But what's happening is I'm watching out there, you know, I'm watching protests from all across the nation. I'm listening to what these people are saying. One, there's no white people up there speaking. The white people have not been invited to come up there and speak um, to you know, you hear these these chants. Um, they, they have their their little um, their, their little group thing chant thing going on that, that is always so wonderful when it comes to act. I'm guilty of it, too. I've been down there on the street doing it, too. Um, you know where they say, uh, say their names, Sandra Blaine, say their name, George Floyd. Say, I didn't hear a lot. I, I don't think I ever heard. I, I don't want to say I never heard it because it's probably incorrect. But it was probably me that said it, you know, uh, Kelly Thomas. And so so someone like me who, while I have no problem with the black man, I have no problem with the gay man, I have no problem with any man who's a man who does things voluntarily uh, and doesn't push himself onto other people, force himself onto other people. Uh, I don't feel like I've been invited to the conversation. And it's obvious from the minimal compared to the size of the population number of people that are on the street so uh, i guess my question would be where is the disconnect between what i should be seeing what i know to be is real uh in in the institutionalized racism and why i don't feel like i'm at all invited to to participate in this like my opinion in this just doesn't matter right i think that these are great questions and um let me take them one at a time. I think that the 
it's complex, right? I think yeah. ultimately we have to look at this in from a, from a, uh, a perspective of empathy. If put yourself put yourself in the shoes, you're the 13 percent minority. There's only 13 percent of people that look like you, and the other the 70 percent. I mean, there's there's maybe 30 percent that kind of resemble you, but more yeah, specifically, right. there are 13 percent black, right? Right. Um, and now you're saying, well, why isn't, aren't white people invited to the table? I think white allies would absolutely be invited to the table. Um, people that, you know, so we have like this response to the uh, Black Lives Matter, right? The response is from the quote unquote opposing side is, mm. no, all lives matter. But right. Black Lives Matter was never meant to say only Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter was always meant to say Black Lives Matter also. Right, we're 13 percent of the population, but yet it, we make up 50 percent of the police brutality uh, killings. Those are actual numbers from from 2019. So 50 percent of the people uh, cops killed were black, but yet they only make up 13 percent of the population. So that doesn't jive. Yes, in numbers, more white people were killed by police, and so absolutely, um, Kelly Thomas and and all of the white people that were killed, Duncan. Um, Duncan Lemp, I think, mm. was the guy's name, the most recent one. Just recently, um, yeah. Favor, I think if Black Lives Matter sh- should also stand for them. Same time, do you, could you believe that you're not standing up when people don't stand up when black people are killed? Why would I, if, if I was if from that community, why would I doubt for and to to protest for Daniel Shaver, if white people don't care. White people didn't protest for Daniel Shaver. Only the anarchists and, liber- and libertarians. We're the only ones that speak out. We, we speak out absolutely about all police brutality, right? No matter what color, the libertarian community, the cop watch community, the cop block community, we speak out against it for everyone. But white people in general did not. White conservatives didn't speak out uh, for Daniel Shaver. White conservatives didn't uh, speak out for... Orlando Castile, who was legally carrying a gun, and he was executed by police for legally carrying his weapon. Where was the NRA? Where was MAGA? Where was uh, the white conservatives who are uh, pro-Second Amendment? So why would, if, if I'm a black man, why would I go to a protest for Daniel Shaver when nobody who, uh, you know, n- none of the Second Amendment community would come to a protest for Orlando Castile? It's understandable. Do I agree that it's a hypocrisy? Yes. But it, it at is. the same time, it's, it's an understandable one, right? right? And until we are willing to step over those lines, until the white conservative community is willing to step over that line and say, you know what, I'm going to stand up for the Second Amendment rights of everyone, no matter what color, and it, instead they just ignore it. When a black person is killed because they had a gun that was legally owned, they say nothing. So it's kind of hypocritical if you, if you sit down when Philando Castillo is killed, right? So that's kind of that's kind of what I. No, I, I, I think I'm, that's. I think that's great points, I, I, and I I think that's a good perspective because I think it's probably a very realistic one. I, I you can, boy, how many times do you see it? I mean, yeah, the number of yeah. white people killed by cops outnumbers the number of black people. Why aren't there more white people out on the street? protesting and if you are a gun supporter and a man of any color is killed while legally carrying a gun by anyone why aren't you out there supporting it and so i I can i can see the futility of trying to invite those who don't want to be invited and the other the other question i would say um yeah the media picks and chooses right for sure people are killed every day black people are killed every day too and we don't hear about every single case we hear about certain cases, I guess, maybe the ones that have the most traumatic video that's going to play well on the news. You know, who's to say why and how the media elite decide to cover certain stories but not others? Daniel Shaver, you know, was executed by police for having a BB gun. He's a white man, uh, for anybody who's not um, familiar with the case. And the cops that killed him got away with it, too. Um, and the media didn't really cover that. I guess it's not as sexy. You know, I don't know. Um but whatever their agenda is, I think, is irrelevant to the real issue. And the real issue is, yes, we should be standing against all police violence, but that doesn't mean 
we, when Black Lives Matter comes out and says, look, we're being killed at a higher rate, we should say, oh, sit down, please kill everybody. That's not fair. It's not right. And it's certainly not empathetic. Um, we all should be standing together. And I think the black community would be willing to stand with us if we would stand with them. And we have more political power. That's really the bottom line here is that white people could stop racism and police brutality tomorrow. There's enough of us that if we stood up and said, no, we're not going to tolerate the government acting like this towards anybody, not just towards blacks, towards anybody, we could stop it. There's 70% of us. We make up. We have the most political power of any group in this country. But we don't. You know, and I see a lot of anarchists talking about Boogaloo. Well, what do you think Boogaloo looks like? You think during Boogaloo there's going to be no destruction of property damage? Uh, private property, rather. Come on. There's always going to be collateral damage. And, yeah, most of, I, I believe, most of the, the property damage, of course, I'm sure there are useful idiots who are just want, want to wild out and will use that as an excuse. But I think most of it is provocateur. And you know how it is when you're in a group like that, when you're in the mob, how the mob mentality takes over. Somebody, a cop, dresses a protest and throws a brick through a window, and then it's like, the mob mentality takes over, and that kind of groupthink mentality does take over. I will not deny that. It's absolutely true. But to say that, that a handful of people doing that, when there's just as many videos of Black Lives Matter activists stopping white people from throwing bricks, stopping white people from spray painting. There was a video going around of a white woman spray painting Black Lives Matter on the side of a building. I and saw that. A black, activist, a black activist went up to her and said, what are you doing? Yeah. This is not what we're doing here. We're peacefully protesting, and you're spray. She's like, I'm supporting Black Lives Matter. No, you're not. You're, what you're doing is helping criminalize these protests. So, uh, you know, there's, there's just as many videos. So anybody that wants to be honest about what's really happening during the rioting, you have to look at all of the context, not just with the mainstream media that usually you don't trust, but now because it's saying something that you believe, oh, yeah, they're just thugs and they just want an excuse and they want to implement socialism. Let me tell you, people calling for the abolishment of police are not about implementing socialism. And you know what? Even if they're hypocritical, even if they, do, if they don't understand the connection there, that the same power structure that would give them all the health care they want or all these other things is the same, health, is the same power structure that's going to murder us. Mm. Um, they may not make that connection, but we can help them make that connection. But you're not going to help them make that connection if you're just saying, ah, oh, you're just a bunch of thugs, sit down. That's absolutely true. Now, I it's it's an interesting place for me to be because, of course, you know, we've been down on the street. We've dodged the pepper spray and the cops trying to run us over with motorcycles and 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 in a much in a, in a different uh, a different protest in a place in a, a place in time where there were a, an interesting mix of people and so early on in the the occupy thing it was a different it was different and it quickly devolved and i think that's what happened here and so i i get to, i see it and i know it's going to happen and of course i i don't petition the government because i don't expect that they're going to change anything so i i have that going against me too uh, so you won't find me out there, um, but I guess uh, it, it makes sense. It really does. I, 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 I mean, see... I, I don't see, I don't see how any anarchist or or any libertarian, even even if you're not a fully, even if you're a minarchist, how you couldn't look at the situation and say, in democracy, the seventy percent holds all the political power. We can end police brutality right now if we just chose to do it. But as a, as a collective, as a society, we don't choose to make that decision. Why? Because it does not affect us to the same degree that it affects people of color. And those are the facts. If you look at the ratios, the ratios are there. And it's very easy for most white people to say when a white person is killed or a black person is killed, oh, they probably deserved it. The police must have had some reason to stop them. Because most well, they already do that by stated. default. That's the problem. Right. Yeah. Most, because most <laughs> people tend towards statism. Most people believe we need a government to keep us safe. And so, therefore, when somebody's killed by police, they most likely deserved it. Yeah. Now, that is oftentimes the argument. Hey, we got just a few more minutes. We're going to go into a break. We'll come back and we'll, uh, we'll wrap this conversation up with Danny. It's been a very enlightening conversation. We'll be right back on Toward Anarchy. 
Well, we're not going to solve racism here, just Danny and I having this conversation. But I'll tell you, um, there's a perspective that that I'm enlightened to in the words that he's using and the way he's choosing to present the topic. And he answered my questions. I, I don't know if he's answered your questions at this point. I, I don't know what questions you might have. And that kind of led me to thinking about something. Maybe I should do a show where I answer um, just some questions from like the chat room, fill up the chat room one show and just do a whole show like that. But um, something to think about maybe coming up here in the future. But as as far as this this conversation goes, I think it's important that um, we we as anarchists realize that uh, I guess in the A to Z and the going from state to no state that there's still the B to Y that has to be dealt with. I, I said this a little earlier in the show, and and that maybe we need to uh, do some of these things to get behind uh, of the protest, <laughs> if not the if not some of the looting and the rioting too. <laughs> you know, I I think that it kind of this this kind of comes full circle back to the beginning of our conversation when we were talking about ego. Mm-hmm. I think that, and you know, I. If there are people in your audience that are like, ah, this guy's, you know, he's a he's race baiting or whatever, you know, all the all the those kind of things, the memes that got thrown out there. If you disagree with me, um, I mean, I want to say this as sensitively and as non judgmentally as possible because I was there too, you know. But I think it comes down to ego. If we're going to say I'm not going to get involved when or protest when a black man gets killed by a cop because Black Lives Matter on other occasions calls for socialized health care. Um, it's not like you're, you're going to go into a protest is going to put Black Lives Matter in charge of the country, right? And then all of a sudden they're going to implement socialized health care. It's just showing the power system that we can come together, right? If you wait for somebody that you agree with 100% the protest next to, it's never going to happen. You're going to sit in your house and just complain about you're not free enough, you're not free enough. But if our... 70% joins with their 13% or the 30%. If we all join together every time and stand together, and I'm telling you, if we stand behind when black people are killed by police, they'll stand behind when white people are killed by police. And we won't have to wait for the media to tell us, oh, this is, this is one that we should be concerned with. We should be concerned with George Floyd, but not with Daniel Shaver or Terry or Terrence, um, what was his name? The homeless guy from L.A. Oh. Right? Like, uh, Kelly Thomas was the homeless Kelly guy Thomas, LA. right, sorry. So, um, you know, we won't have to wait for that. When it goes around on social media, we should be making us think every time government commits murder. What's the worst crime? Throwing a brick through a window, destroying or damaging some, pro- some property, or the state killing people? You know, I'm, I'm, I, I don't agree with property damage, but at the same time, the murder is the worst crime. I would rather stand next to a Black Lives Matter protester against government murder than say I can't stand next to them because somebody in that protest threw a brick at, at a window. Right. I think that's I the perfect to the- place to, to leave it. I, I really do. And unfortunately, I don't think we have a choice because the show's going to end whether we want to or not. Brother, it's been so great catching up with you, Danny. Take care, man. Thank you. It's always Thanks, good brother. to have to be on. Thanks. We'll talk to you later. Hey, and we'll be back next week. You're listening to Republic Broadcasting Network because you can handle the truth.